I'm Diego Garza Rodriguez, a software engineer at Microsoft, and welcome to the day three and final level of this year's Hack the Classroom. Over the past two days, we've been sharing tools to help students and educators prepare for Hour of Code. But today, we're going to do things a little bit differently with the help of a few special guests. We will show you how to apply your new knowledge beyond the classroom, and how STEAM can lead to exciting career fields like game design, engineering, and even space travel. If you want to learn more, stick with us. You will see that you will have a lot of things to learn and have fun while being excited of the new opportunities that will come around when working with this team. So that's everything for me. And well, I leave you with our special guest. See ya. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Hamron. I run gaming engineering at Microsoft for Team Xbox, which means that I, my team builds the hardware and the software on the Xbox consoles and all of our gaming hardware. So I have a team of electrical engineers and software engineers um, that build everything from the operating system to what you see when you turn on um, an Xbox. My journey to getting here has been one that started way back with my degree in engineering and operations research, and then took me through a whole host of different hardware and software companies um, to land me back here in engineering. You know, I started my career as a program manager, actually working at Microsoft, and I then went to business school and then I worked um, briefly at a venture capital firm looking at investments in hardware so and software. And then I, I went back to, I really missed working on products. And so I went back to a, a startup that actually built um, a window, a very small Windows uh, PC, which was uh, called an OQO. Now this company unfortunately did not survive. That doesn't mean I didn't learn tons of amazing things um, on this product. After that, I went and worked at a company called Jawbone. We made a Bluetooth headset that was pioneering in terms of noise canceling and also in terms of design. From there, I moved on to a bigger company that was in a similar space called Plantronics, where I managed a whole portfolio um, of products that I took to market for both businesses and for consumers. But really, my love is in consumer products. And so I ended up back at, a, at one of my favorite um, jobs, except for, of course, this one at, at uh, Xbox, which was working on a product called Dropcam. And this was a home monitoring camera. And the cool thing about this company was that our founder really just saw a need in the market. He was home with his parents and they um, needed to see, you know, basically what was happening in their neighborhood on their lawn. And there was no good cameras. They were either super expensive, insecure, hard to set up. And the and he went um, with a partner and built a cloud, um, a cloud monitoring camera. And it was super simple concepts but hard to execute and i learned tons here we built the company from you know just under 20 people we built a new brand and ultimately our product was so successful that it was acquired by google and nest and became what is the the nest camera from there i went on to work at oculus launching the first um, oculus rift um, which was a virtual reality headset and the theme, if you, if I look back across all these products, is one thing I really loved was building new products and new categories. So some of these product types of products had been around for a long time, but we had a new spin on them, making them easier for consumers, more affordable. And from Oculus, I came back to Microsoft and then ultimately um, ended up back in gaming, you know, back in engineering. And so my career, um, you know, started in engineering, went to in technical roles, into marketing and business roles, and then, you know, back to an engineering role. And I guess the thing I want to share with you is kind of two things. One, um, I felt like majoring in engineering gave me the best basis to do tons of things. Um, it was, it made me, it taught me how to think critically. It taught me um, how to, to really, um, to gain confidence that I could solve really complex problems. So if you don't even know what you want to go do, I, I think that majoring in an engineering that you love and enjoy can take you so many places. I thought about other majors and I just really felt like in hindsight, um, that, that engineering prepared me for 
basically anything I wanted to go do. And the second thing I would say is that you don't have to decide where your career is going to take you right now. You just have to make sure that you build some really critical skills that you can take and then see what opportunities arise. People always come ask me like, well, how do I you know, plan out my whole career? Well, you want to look ahead. You want to make decisions that will take you ultimately where you want to go. But lots of it is going to be that chance favors the prepared mind. So you're going to, um, you know, work hard in school, major in something, go get a job and you and, and that job's going to open up lots of different opportunities for you and you just have to be open to them. And if I look back, I would have never thought that I, I was where I am today, but I'm thrilled with the, um, the opportunities that got presented to me. So good luck and I hope to see you in a STEM program that you love sometime soon. Thanks for letting me join you today. What's up, everyone? This is Afiz, AKA Fizzle the Engineer or Fizzle the Rap Gamer, depending on how you got here. And over the years, I've worked at a variety of companies, including Nintendo, Sony on the PlayStation, and Microsoft on OneDrive, a number of other products, as well as Xbox. And throughout my career, the value of critical thinking has been reinforced. And to give you a few examples to illustrate my point, Recently, a number of things that I've worked on have shipped, about which I'm excited. That's uh, the Xbox Series S, Xbox Series X, uh, the PlayStation 5, and the Hour of Code release for Minecraft Education Edition. And it's crazy that I've worked on all these things in the past like, year and a half. But when working on the Xbox, there was a situation where, that happens pretty frequently, users are trying to install a game and they run out of space on their drive. So the old solution was to go through their collection of games and just manually find a game or multiple games that they could uninstall to free up enough space to install this new game. So the idea was to suggest content to make the process easier for users. So the solution that, that, I, that I approached the problem with was to group the content or group the games and apps into different buckets depending on recency of use and within those buckets sort the items by their size. And then I'd start pulling from the oldest buckets to remove content and progress to newer buckets if necessary. And of course, the reasoning for that is because if you haven't played something in a very long time, chances are you're going to be more likely to be willing to part with this item from your drive. Now, another challenge that I faced was recently when I was working on the Hour of Code release for Minecraft. And you're dealing with one, the game, and then you're dealing with Code Builder essentially two separate entities, but what happens in Code Builder affects the game. So the idea was to figure out a way for these two, basically the world and the Code Builder to interact with each other. And this used a variety of languages because it spans of, um, our game spans a variety of, of devices. And um, so we were talking languages like Java, C++, Objective-C, TypeScript, JavaScript, working with all of these languages and ultimately we came up with a solution that enabled us to store information within the world that Code Builder can access and World Builders can access to create more immersive worlds and experiences for the students that are gonna be accessing or playing Hour of Code this year. Those were just a couple of examples of how critical thinking has been essential to my success as a software engineer over the years. And I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Hello everyone, I'm Sarita and I'm the founder and CEO of Trustabit. We're building a technology that helps airlines solve flight delay issues to improve their overall passenger experience. Now, my passion for tech started when I was around eight years old. My mom had recently got a new computer for work and I accidentally broke it. Listen, I was so worried that I'd be in big trouble, but to my surprise, instead of getting mad, she just told me, it's okay, I just had to fix it. But you don't have to take my word for it. Mom? Hi, Sarita. Oh, I remember that like it was yesterday. You got almost everything right. It's true, I didn't look mad about the computer, but I was pretty confident you would figure something out. You always do. Even from an early age, you had that spark, that stubbornness, and that persistence that could drive me crazy. But it also meant that you never, ever gave up. Thanks, Mom. She loves that story. 
especially getting to tell her side. My mom has always been my biggest supporter. She's passed that spark on to me, and now I'm passing it down to my daughter. I didn't know at the time, but this was a great lesson in problem solving. I found out that I was fascinated by all of the different parts of the computer and how each piece had a unique purpose, which all came together to provide certain functions. One of the keys to being successful in tech is understanding the proper input will provide a desired output. Now, for example, my company Trustabit. We started out of the need to solve a problem. In our example, we needed an easier way for airlines to compensate passengers when their flights are delayed. Part of which makes this process difficult is tracking down little pieces of paper. So we made the vouchers digital instead of printing them on paper. Now, this is only the tip of the iceberg. Once you have a great idea, next, you need to figure out how to build it. Now, that's where tech comes in. It may take version after version to finally get the solution you want. So a certain amount of mental toughness is definitely necessary. What's most important is that you never, ever give up. You'll find these skills permeate other parts of your life. Now, for me, this was basketball. Now, as an athlete in high school and college, I had to be persistent, disciplined, and show a certain amount of leadership in order to succeed. These skills have always stuck with me. My STEM journey started in the US Navy, where I worked as a cryptologic technician. I learned all about signals intelligence, code breaking, and most importantly, critical skills like problem solving. After the Navy, I got my degree in computer information systems from the University of Detroit Mercy and focused my career on platform architecture, analytics, and big data. But I wanted something more. I wanted to do something I was excited about. This led to starting Trustabit. It's important to know that you're never too young or too old to begin building STEM skills and there's a way to incorporate STEM no matter what you're interested in. For example, my daughter became interested in STEM after we built a mining rig together when she was only seven years old. A mining rig is what we use to mine cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum. She loves art and wanted her own brand of paint pens, but she struggled to see how she could use art and tech together. She would say things like, I really like learning coding, but I also kind of really like art. So we sat down and went through the process of starting a new brand. What problems can we solve and how do we build it? She listed what she liked about the paint pens that were on the market and what she thought could be improved upon. Then we started to talk about how to build a website so people can find and buy your products. From there and after lots of testing and a little trial and error, I was able to help my daughter start her very first company, Wonderpins. Now she sees that you can take your tech skills and use it to showcase your love of art, even at 10 years old. Hi, Mom. Hey, Evan. What you doing here? Well, I've been talking about Wonderpins, so I thought you might want to hear from the company's still founder. That's a good point. I love your help. I really love working with my mom. She's taught me so much, not just coding, but also leadership and self-confidence. And following your passion. She's shown me that I could do anything. And not that it matters, but I didn't beat you by launching my first startup at 10 years old. <laughs> well, I can't argue with that. And I love working with you too. A saying that has always stuck with me is that you can't be who you can't see. Growing up, I didn't see black women launching startups, and in my career, I've often been the only woman and or the only black person in the room. I truly hope my story inspires students of color to explore STEM and shows them that they have what it takes to build the solutions that they can't find in the world. My advice to you guys is to stay curious, make mistakes, don't be afraid to ask questions, and always remember you can. That's all for now. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned for more awesome STEM stories.
Well, welcome to day three of Half the Classroom to everyone from around the world. So good day in whatever time zone you might be in. My name is Elaine Ho, and I'm the Deputy Associate Administrator for NASA STEM Engagement Program. And from all of us at NASA to all of you, we'd like to say happy 20th anniversary of humans living and working on the International Space Station. This means that humans have been living and working on the International Space Station continuously for the last 20 years. That is a huge milestone for us as we plan our missions to the moon and Mars and beyond. Today, I am truly honored to be moderating a conversation with two amazing astronauts and role models, Mr. Charlie Duke and Mr. Charles Simone. So let's start with a quick round of introductions. Charlie, you want to go ahead? It's a pleasure being here with uh, you, Elaine, and Charles. Uh, I grew up in South Carolina, and my heroes in those days were military people in, in our country. So I ended up at the Naval Academy, where I fell in love with airplanes, and I went in Air Force uh, flight training in uh, September of 1965, there was a call for astronauts, more astronauts. And so I applied and was selected in 66, and that started my career uh, as an astronaut. Wow, what an incredible journey. And I know we're going to get to hear more about that part when you're an astronaut. Charles, what about you? I'm Charles Simone. I was born in Hungary and I grew up in Hungary in 1966, went on to school at Berkeley, California. Did my PhD at Stanford, joined Xerox, and after Xerox, I uh, joined Microsoft in 1981, where I've been working since, and had a great experience with creating some exciting software programs such as Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. After 2000, there was this tremendous opportunity for civilians to go to space as tourists which was really unheard of. So I um, signed up to become a tourist and uh, flew in 2007 to the International Space Station. For the first time among tourists, I flew again in 2009. Wow, what an incredible way to make it to space. Well, today being the day three of Hack the Classroom, and day three is all about exciting opportunities and careers students can pursue. Could you share how you developed your interest in space exploration? I think uh, for me, I was always uh, interested in academics. I did well. I was graduated with distinction, uh, went in the Air Force, and then got motivated as a result of uh, Sputnik and then meeting some astronauts later on. It, it seemed to me for a, pi- for a fighter pilot and a test pilot, being an astronaut is the best job you could have. Charles, what about you? I was nine years old when Sputnik won. Uh, went up, and of course, it's a, it was a big deal behind the Iron Curtain, and uh, it got me very excited about rockets and space flight, and I was really concentrating on that. Well, it sounds like for both of you, you had people along the way, as Charlie, you said, giving you that nudge or just role models you can follow that really make a difference. So data plays a key role in helping us get to the International Space Station or the moon. Everything from the amount of fuel to the total thrust needed to reach escape velocity, all of that data is tracked. So a question for the two of you, what role did data play in your journey to space? Well, without uh, accurate data, uh, you'd never make it to the moon. You could manually fly the spacecraft from orbit to the moon, but you needed to follow uh, the, uh, the attitude and the flight plan and all that was data. And if that wasn't being given to you, you aborted. Every bit of it sounds critical. What about you, Charles? Well, we, we didn't go to the moon, but we still had to find the International Space Station somewhere out in space. And, uh, um, and its parameters, its orbital parameters are changing all the time. The, the last minute updates for maybe a, a minute or two a delay in a, if for the time and the duration of a of a uh, orbit adjustment burn. We just went with the pencil and erased the old uh, marks and wrote, wrote in the the new num the new numbers. So that was our data processing on board of Soyuz. So whether you're using a pencil and paper or you've got mission control at Houston, uh, all of that data is tracked and just so critical. 
We also wanted to take a moment to recognize all of those who participated in our Day of Data Visualization Challenge at aka.ms slash Excel Day of Data. We hope you had fun exploring data all about rockets, launches, astronauts, and spacewalks. And given the number of entries, we'll announce one winner across all the questions. So Charles, as the original creator of Excel, would you please do us the honors? It was really impressive to see what everyone could build in Excel. It was difficult to select one, but we have an excellent visualization that we are thrilled to announce. Our congratulations to the winner of the Day of Data Visualizations Challenge, Chris moreno Stoko from the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. Chris combined a curated data set of human visits to space with an imaginative visualization of gender distribution and nationalities. Thank you to everyone who participated. We hope you had fun. Wow, those data visualizations were amazing. It's great to see all the things that we can do with data and how important it is to space exploration. And given that the winning entry was focused on diversity in STEM, I wanted to give a special message to our girls out there that STEM is for you. Teachers, parents, and those of us at NASA believe in you and that you can have a career in STEM. If you ever find yourself feeling out of place, I hope you'll remember the last thing that STEM fields need are more people who look the same or think the same. Coming up with new ideas requires different perspectives and different ways of thinking, and that's exactly what you girls have to offer, so don't give up. So now I'd like to talk to the both of you more about your careers and learn more about what your experience was like in space. So Charlie, we know that you left a photo of your family on the moon, and that really highlights the human aspect of human space exploration. Can you share a bit more about that whole story? When I actually launched to the moon, Charles, my oldest, was uh, just turned seven. My youngest, Tom, was almost five, a month away from being five. And so to get them excited about what their dad was doing, uh, I said, well, you guys like to go to the moon with dad. And uh, they said, yeah, that'd be great. I said, well, we'll do it through a picture. And so we had a friend from NASA come over and take a photograph in our backyard. Uh, with my wife and the two boys and myself. And I got permission from uh, flight crew director, uh, uh, Dick Slayton, uh, to carry it with me. And, uh, and I could leave it on the moon. What a touching story. I know the astronauts gearing up to go to the International Space Station also talk a lot about their family support and what a gift that your sons can cherish for the rest of their lives. That's a wonderful story. So Charles, for you, you were one of the first space tourists and paused your career in technology to visit the International Space Station. What did your preparation look like to go to space and how did the skills from your job at Microsoft play a role? I basically told everyone um, to that I'm taking time off, I'm, um, I'm reneging on all my commitments because I, I plan to go to space and um, I basically moved to Moscow. I wasn't married at the time, so that made it somewhat uh, easier. Eight months of training that included maybe one third of, of, um, of technical training, one third of physical training, and one third of language training in, in Russian. Uh, it, was, it was a little bit like going to school again, and a, a wonderful time, and, and made, made uh, a lot of friends. It sounds like for the both of you, you had family and friends to, to really carry you through, but it also sounds like you believed in yourself too. So that's fantastic. So what are some common traits among astronauts that you've seen? Well, when I was in uh, the astronaut program, uh, I found uh, all of us had a focus. Uh, we had to keep our eyes on the road, if you will. What was our objective? Uh, how are we going to get there? And we learn teamwork. Uh, we learn how to work together to support one another. A crew is a crew. So I hear really teamwork sounding, really resounding as one of those key traits. So Charles, what would you say to the kids it's, who are looking to become it's astronauts? Very similar. It's very similar in the in the Russian uh, cosmonaut corps. The psychologist at uh, Star City told me that space flight is not primarily 
a physical challenge. It is a mental challenge. So the astronauts or cosmonauts, they have this mental preparedness, this mental toughness. It's more of assembling crews that can work together well. All right, so we're in the last segment here. So to close out, what advice do you have for students as they navigate what they want to learn and do? My, my idea is to, uh, as I did in my career, is pick an area of study that motivates you uh, to do your best and to uh, uh, work hard and uh, and be satisfied in your career. Tell kids that always pick a subject and a course that you think you're going to be happy in, even though if your desire, your end goal is to be an astronaut. Now, being an astronaut, there's a, a wide variety of careers that you could be in. I think that uh, uh, learning the STEM skills, it will be basic in the future for whatever you are going to do. Once you have made sure that you covered all the basics, then you should follow your heart and passion. And always seek out the leaders and follow, seek out and follow the leaders in the field that you have chosen. Those are wise words. I hope that students watching this realize their passion for math and science really can open a world of possibilities. All it takes is a spark, and you two are proof that a spark of interest in STEM can lead to some pretty amazing places on our planet and beyond. I hope you enjoyed our time together. And on behalf of myself and everyone at NASA, I'd like to say thank you, students. Your generation will make incredible strides in space exploration, and I can't wait to see what you all achieve. Bye. Salute to everybody. Enjoyed it. Hey there, everybody. I am Josh Funk, and today we're going to put the A in STEAM. I'm an author and I wrote picture books like the ones behind me, Lady Pancake and Sir French Toast, but I also wrote How to Code a Sandcastle and How to Code a Roller Coaster, because I am not just an author, but I am also a software engineer. And if you don't think that those careers have much crossover, you're not alone. On the surface, coding and creative writing seem like completely different things, but in reality, Good writers and good coders have a lot in common. I started my career as a software engineer, and that's what I studied in school. That is kind of how I thought of myself as a math and science kid. I was okay at reading and writing, but I was always a little bit better at math. And, and so that's what I studied when I went to college. And what I do today is I build models and simulations of networks. So. I know that sounds complicated, but it's almost kind of like a video game. I don't know if you've ever played The Sims or something like that, but some simulation game where, you know, maybe you've, you've played a, a simulation game where you built a roller coaster or even something like Animal Crossing. That is simulating a little village or an island. And so um, that is what I do. I build simulations of things like networks. So how your internet works in your house or how it works in your school or how it works for your whole town. There are a whole bunch of pieces that make up a network, routers and switches and things that most of us don't really think about, but some people do. And I'm one of the people that helps make sure that your networks work properly by building simulations of them. I build virtual environments. I work in virtual environments that help test things. Sometimes it's networks, but sometimes it could be things like a flight plan or a traffic light in a new location. Um, that is the kinds of things that I, that I do during my day job. And I write the code that underneath runs all of those simulations. When I began to work on my first book, I started seeing similarities between coding and creative writing. Both of them take a lot of editing and revising and making changes, both because sometimes it doesn't really work at first. I mean, when you code something, you might think it's gonna work, but you realize that it crashes. And so you have to debug it. And the same thing with writing stories. In a story, it all has to have 
you know, a good character and a plot that makes sense. And sometimes when you're writing a story in your first draft, it doesn't, it doesn't quite work. And so I like to share my writing with my friends and they give me feedback and they help me figure out how to make the story better. Coding and writing stories are very, very similar. Sometimes you have to go back to square one and that's okay, but you're not really at square one because you learned a lot from that first attempt and your second attempt is gonna be even better. And that's just the beginning. For me, the best part of writing code and writing stories is getting to create new worlds. When I started writing How to Code a Sandcastle, I had to think a lot about what it takes to both code and what it takes to make a story. Because coding requires things like sequences and loops and if-then-elses. And so I wanted to write a story that had all of those ingredients in it. But a story also has to have a good character, like Pearl and Pascal. It has to have conflict or something that they're trying to do that they aren't able to. And in this one, they want to build a sandcastle. And I thought, well, what is the best way to write a story about coding? And I realized that what do you do with code? You make things or you build things. Well, what do kids do with? They make things like sandcastles. They build sandcastles. So it took a while, but eventually I figured out that there was a way to code a sandcastle. Pearl sees the world through a lens of coding and she and her robot Pascal, the two of them use loops and sequences and if then else's to build a sandcastle. Because when you go through your everyday life, you have to do things in the proper order. Sequences matter. If you get up and brush your teeth and eat breakfast and get dressed and go to school, that's the order of things that you might do. But if you get dressed before you wake up, that doesn't really make sense. And if you go to school and then brush your teeth, that's probably also something that is a little strange to do. Although brushing your teeth after lunch isn't a bad thing. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. But in building a sandcastle, you have to scoop the sand and dump it into your pail and then dump the pail out and then pat it down. And then you have to repeat that. And when you repeat something in code, you can use a loop. And an if then else, or sometimes called a conditional, is something that you have to do all the time. You know, if I take a break right now, then I'm going to have to finish my work later. But if I don't take a break, I can finish my work now. Or if I eat my cake before my lunch, then I won't have any room left and I'll be full and I won't have room left for my apple. So maybe I should eat my apple first. In any case, coding is all about making things. So when I decided to write a book about coding, I knew I would focus on something like a sandcastle or a roller coaster. And in these books, that is what Pearl and her robot Pascal do. They build a sandcastle using coding concepts like loops and sequences and if then else's. And they go to an amusement park and use variables to help them keep track of how many tokens they have, which allow them to go on different rides. And it allows them to determine whether or not the lines are too long or they are short. And that's what variables do. And so in these two books, Pearl and Pascal have adventures, but they do everything using coding. Just like some books might use creativity to solve a problem, or they might use imagination, or they might use magic. In this book, they use coding. And that's how the adventures of Pearl and her robot Pascal came to be. One of my favorite things to do in writing is to create new worlds. I like to create worlds where there are pancakes and French toast racing through a refrigerator. I like to create worlds where a boy and a dragon are pen pals. I like to create worlds where a little girl and her robot have adventures. But coding is also a lot like creating worlds. You can create worlds with your code. Each function might define a new type of creature, or it might make up some environment for people to live in. Sometimes it's like in an app where 
You might have characters and you might have a place where those characters go. Other times, it might be like in my day job where I build simulations. I might simulate an airplane flying or I might simulate a town that has a whole network full of traffic lights and cars driving around and buildings and libraries and offices and homes and all of these things are simulated and that is something that I like to do. I build worlds using both my imagination with coding and my imagination with writing for children. The strongest connection between coding and creative writing is change. Just like writing different styles come and go, coding languages like Perl and Fortran and Java and even C++ are always evolving and expanding. Good writers and good coders have the skills to pivot, problem solve, and follow their passion wherever it leads. I wanna thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for listening and remember that STEAM can take you anywhere. Hi, my name is Kiki Protzman, and I'm a computer science educator, curriculum designer, and author. I became interested in computer science when I was a very young girl. I was homesick from school one day, and my dad handed me a book on the programming language BASIC and challenged me to see what I could do. By the time my mom got home, I'd written a program that could guess which member of my family you were based on your eye color and your hair color. When I went off to college, I decided to study computer science because I wanted to be able to make cows fly like they did in the movie Twister. It didn't take me long to realize that computer science is a lot more involved than I ever imagined. What I didn't realize was that I was one of just two women in my undergrad CS program. That fact didn't strike me until I went for my master's and found that I was one of only three women in my class of nearly a hundred. That's when I found out that there was a problem. I worked with the faculty to start a women in computer science group. I wanted to show everyone that coding is an art form. It's a passion. It's something you can do to express yourself like poetry or painting. And when you're done, you have a product that actually does something. Our club developed a series of near peer opportunities where college women could bring CS to high schoolers and then high schoolers would take it to elementary students. We called this the waterfall. We were able to appeal to someone's desire to help and attract students who might not otherwise believe they would be good at CS under the guise that younger girls needed their expertise. It was such a fun program, and it continued for years after I left. All of those experiences taught me that there's a huge misunderstanding around what computer science is. It's not sitting in a dark, stuffy room by yourself, struggling with complex mathematics. And computer science is more than just learning how to program. It's solving problems. It's figuring things out. It's having an unlimited amount of computational power to throw at the world's problems. It's such an empowering road to travel. And when women are left out of the journey, not only do they lose out on the skills that are capable of strengthening and enriching their lives, but the world of technology loses out on the perspective of half the population. Tech suffers because it's failed to capture the diverse perspectives it needs to appeal to its entire audience. My activism doesn't stop there. At that time, research was pointing to mentorship as one of the leading factors differentiating women who choose computer science from women who don't. My investigation showed that it wasn't just the presence of a role model that mattered, but having someone there as you were growing up to show that CS was a viable option before you'd made up your mind about who you are or what you're good at. This meant that if we wanted more women in CS, we needed to reach more girls while they were young, ideally in grade school. The problem was, at the time, 
CS was mostly taught in college and mostly by lecture. That definitely wouldn't work for elementary school students. So before change could be made, I had to create an entire set of curriculum capable of teaching actual CS concepts to kids under the age of 12. I started a nonprofit called Thinkersmith and got to work. A couple of years later, a nonprofit called Code.org formed. They also had a mission to bring computer science to all kids by reaching out to them at an early age. Our organizations merged, and I spent the next five years cultivating and curating sets of curriculum for millions of students across the world. Now, thanks in part to those initiatives, the U.S. is seeing growth in female participation in AP computer science, computer science in college, and in the technological workplace. This is absolutely critical because without the female representation in technology, our technology won't represent females. And this might mean the need for actively advocating for females, or at very least, advocating for open-minded programs so that women aren't excluded. Because at the moment, females are less likely to self-select into the technology track, even if the experience is perfect for them. So, if you're interested in computer science and technology, I have some advice for you. Don't let its reputation scare you. Every path is different. Try it and find out for yourself. Also, going in, you should feel confident knowing that technology is built through trial and error. Mistakes are super important and super common. You should never, ever let someone try to convince you that failure is forbidden. Failure is the greatest teacher. So try something, fail, learn, and try again. You don't need a pricey program or elite teachers. Hop onto the internet, explore programs like Make Code, watch videos by other tech creators, and start playing. Because whether it's mapping a human genome or finding the largest prime number, so many things couldn't be accomplished in our lifetimes just using human power. If you're interested in solving the world's most complicated problems, getting word out to a lot of people, or tackling the unknown, computer science just might be the right path for you. Thanks for joining me today. Stay tuned for more STEM stories and make sure to check out my YouTube channel if you're looking to get started with coding. Bye. Hi, my name is Joey Jones and I'm a creative director. I work mostly in animation and visual effects and motion design. So what I do is I tell stories for brands or companies that want to share their products, which is a better way of saying that I'm in advertising. So I do animation for advertising. So whether it's a game that someone wants to promote or a toy or a new piece of hardware like a computer or a phone or a pair of headphones, my job is taking that product and telling a story to try to convince someone that they like it enough that they want to buy it. And the way we do that is using technology to create compelling and incredibly rich experiences, whether it's a little movie or an AR experience or a VR experience or an online website to be able to show them how this product is worth investing their time in. I was one of those kids growing up that was always drawing, uh, making art, animating, building stuff. And um, I was also not sure I could make a living doing that. I didn't know if I could actually raise a family making art. And since I was pretty good at math, and uh, loved computers, uh, I said, hey, I'll go into architecture. And so I got a degree in architecture and while studying in architecture, fell in love with building and animating in the computer. So I take a camera and have it fly through a space that I designed. And I quickly realized that that skill set, 
I could also animate and tell stories, which I always wanted to do. And living in Southern California, I could actually make a living doing it. So through circumstances, I uh, ended up um, studying architecture and then going back to school uh, at an art school that exclusively only um, trained designers and artists and filmmakers and animators and product designers. And there I really learned how to develop a craft of telling a story with the computer. And in sometimes even going there and writing math or code to tell the stories. Um, so it's this perfect merge of art and science and engineering and design and pulling all those together to the kind of left and right hand sides of your body and your brain to be able to produce a work of art or produce a story. So you'll see in my work a huge reliance on being able to use the computer as a true collaborator. There was a time when you had to draw every frame in an animation. And today, you tell the computer, I want this object here at frame one and here at frame 30, and the computer does all those frames in between. Now it's up to you to say what those frames kind of look like and tell the computer how to make those look like, but the flexibility and the power is unprecedented of what you used to be able to do. And you have to be able to know and be, feel confident to be able to get inside the guts of that sometimes, that software, that technology, and be able to alter it to make your dreams come alive. So a big part of my job is staying on top of tech. So whether it is the latest piece of software that lets us do a bigger explosion or a faster explosion or simulate hair on a character or do claw simulation on a character animation, or whether it's a big platform change. For instance, if now we have to figure out how to create an experience or tell a story with a pair of goggles on for VR or AR or MR, oftentimes we are given a tool set and it's for us to dictate how we use that tool. In order to know how to use that tool, we're often using both a science perspective and an arts perspective, or we even figuring out how does this actually gonna work in the real world. If we create an experience with a pair of goggles, how many people are gonna be able to kind of understand how to use those pair of goggles and what that experience is like. If I were to give someone who was just starting out some advice, I would tell them that the mobile phone, which everyone carries around their pocket, their purse, their backpack, has completely changed the way that we interface with the world will become even more pervasive and more important and more a part of our lives. And at some point, that thing that we hold in our hands will most likely be on our face. It'll most likely be on our wrist. It'll most likely be invisible to us. And being able to be proficient and being able to control and harness that coding is incredibly powerful. So right now we pull out our phones to take pictures. And most people say that the camera will be the next web browser, that you'll use your camera to document the world and be able to interact with those pictures and hyperlink them and be able to travel to different places online through your pictures. Being able to harness that code is pretty powerful. And being able to do it with a story using zeros and ones, that's where I'm really interested and I think that's where we see the future. And having the ability to know how to pull that stuff off, to pull off those stories, is really gonna set yourself apart from the others. Hey everyone, my name is Joseph Ranke and I'm the director of Club for the Future which is a nonprofit founded by Blue Origin to inspire students to pursue careers in STEM and really help them visualize the future of life in space. And to support this really awesome day of Hack the Classroom of careers and opportunities, Club thought it'd be a really interesting perspective to hear from someone whose job it is to help students, you know, in that first step towards a professional career. So please say hello to Sarah Knights, the Blue Origin Internship Program Manager. Hey, Sarah, how are you doing? Hi, Joseph. I'm completely fabulous. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you calling in from today? 
I'm calling in from uh, the beautiful West Texas launch site that we have out here where our rocket New Shepard launches and lands. And I'm calling from within our payload processing facility, which is where all of the cool payloads that fly to space come right out of the crew capsule sitting behind you crew capsule. and into this lab. <laughs> You're just casually hanging out on a rocket launch site. That's so yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's our rocket farm. It's incredible. <laughs> I love it down there. So Sarah, what does a program manager do? Tell us a little bit about your role. As the intern program manager, I first and foremost work with our incredible students, our interns that come in. Uh, we have three sessions that happen a year. And then my other part of my job is to work with the engineers and the project managers all across the entire company to make sure that we have really, really good projects for the interns to work on and that it's meaningful and it's helping our mission along. I do find, like most superheroes, people in the space industry have an interesting past that spawned their passion. So it's kind of curious on your origin story, Sarah. Where did your passion for space come from? Yeah, absolutely. So my passion came from being a little kid and being obsessed with nature, like <laughs> like going outside from bugs to birds to fish to mountains and camping and hiking to laying out at night and staring at the incredible stars in the sky wherever I was. And once I got into high school and I got into calculus and physics, and I realized that using those two tools, you can model the entire natural world. And I was sold. I was like, okay, physics. <laughs> You're That's sold. My I got <laughs> yeah, it has to be physics. And so I got into school uh, studying physics and found that the application of that study to astronomy was a really natural thing. So I did a lot of research in that area at first. But then once I graduated, I realized that my other huge passion in life is not just science, but it's teaching people about science. So my entire career has been spent on, uh, you know, doing public outreach and, and helping people realize how incredible science is in our world. So I'd like to take a small step backwards, just so we're on the same page, because I think an internship is su has such a broad definition. So just curious from your perspective and your role, like what is an internship? Yeah, our interns are hired like full-time employees, but they're just here for a short amount of time. And the benefit to the student is twofold, I think. One, you get to interview a company, right? You get to come in yeah. and you're like, okay, well, right now I'm going to be a rocket scientist for the next four months and I'm going to see if I like that or not. So it's a great temporary way to come in and get that that you know, look into a company in a, in a way that you wouldn't normally from just Googling things online. Totally. And then the other side of it is to learn something new. Most of the interns that I match with projects, I really try and stretch them, right? Like rely on the knowledge they already have, but get them into a place where they're really going to grow and they're going to learn a lot. Are internships usually only for engineers or programmers? We have internships across many different disciplines here. Right now we're focused primarily on engineers. Um, who are coming in, but we also have communications and public relations and a variety of other positions. And especially as Joseph, I know you know, our goal yeah. here at Blue is to have millions of people living and working in space. And right now we're just in this tiny step I where know. we're designing the vehicles, but soon we're going to need so many more types of careers and people who can go out and can help us establish that enduring human presence in space. I love it. So we're just building the infrastructure, right, to something far greater. While we're focusing on engineers right now, I think that that will change a lot in the coming years. Yeah. Speaking of the coming years, are there any like specific jobs you see popping up that are really interesting that maybe didn't exist, you know, five, 10 years ago? That's such a great question. <laughs> I think that there's a million. Um, maybe for a second, though, I'll focus on the different types of physicians that students who might be interested in coding or computer Ooh. programming might be able to get. Our rockets are autonomous, which means that they launch and land themselves. So there's so <laughs> much software that goes into that. There's the software on the rocket itself that you know guides it up into space there's the software that you know looks at the ground and controls it back to earth and makes it land there's all of the software in our ground systems the thing that the, you know when you press the button that launches the rocket <laughs> all of that is software that has been designed in-house there's software on our test stands there's software um, that you know develops all of the internal systems that we use to be able to build a rocket like tracking all of the parts on the floor and how we can purchase things so so there's a ton of software jobs that we have available. Um, as far I, as things in the future that we might have, I mean, who knows? Like 10 right? years, I know it doesn't sound like that much, but 10 years seems like forever from now. <laughs> 
I love it. So speaking of that, like 10 to 20 years and everything that we're building, the infrastructure and the jobs to come, uh, what do you think it's going to mean to be an astronaut in the near future or even the long term future? Is that changing? Is the definition of that changing? Absolutely. Um, you know, we think of an astronaut right now and you probably think of an engineer who's who might be a pilot and has studied their whole life. Right. Our goal is to make sure that all goes out the window. Right. So we're going to need when you, we talk about millions of people living and working in space, we're going to need everybody. We're going to need artists. We're going to need welders. We're going to need farmers, uh, you know, on top of all of the other engineers, lawyers, like there's basically every position that exists on earth could also exist in space. Um, um, so I think that our entire vision of what an astronaut is, is going to fundamentally change. So what are some, let's say skills, hard skills or soft skills or some sort of combination that students can do right now to kind of get ready to have a career like this in the space industry? When the interns come in, the ones that are most successful are the ones who ask questions, who Ooh. are curious, who admit that they don't know things, and are just a complete sponge for all of the information that can come in towards them. Um, I definitely say that that's one of the key things. Another key thing is communication. So make sure that people have really strong communication skills so they can pass on that technical knowledge that they may already have. And then my final big thing is, you know, be nice. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's so fun to work on a team that it smart. goes a long way, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Who's, you know, teams who are smart and accomplished and are nice to each other. I love so. that. And I love that you brought up the communication aspect, just because being a non-technical person myself and, you know, having a background in more in economics uh, and coming to Blue Origin, it's been so beneficial to have people write something on a whiteboard that looks like Klingon. And then <laughs> I ask questions and they're able to break it down. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. Absolutely. There's not a single person who comes into this company who knows everything. And that's a good thing, right? We're trying to solve problems that have never been solved before. And so we need people who are open and excited to learn. So you brought up millions of people living and working in space. So I wonder if we just fast forwarded a few simple decades. Uh, what space job do you have, Sarah? Oh my gosh, such a great question. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I found that my entire career, I've just followed my passion and followed opportunities when they came up. To me, and what I've realized is that focusing on people and building relationships is one of the most powerful things that you can do. And so I think whenever you go into an internship or a new opportunity, really get to know people. You know, the judges at the robotics competition or, you know, even just your teacher and get to know them. And, and it's possible that one day they'll help you along in your journey. I love that, right? Build out a network. And like exactly. soon you have all these, you know, connections and friends that just yeah. kind of help you along. That's definitely how I've gotten where I am. It's just literally people giving me opportunities off of conversations or like a dinner one night and like exploring things that I had no idea I was interested in. People genuinely want you to succeed. And if they can, you know, extend a hand and help you up, they will. Uh, I thought we'd kind of maybe wrap up the day with some rapid fire questions. What do you say to that? Sounds great. Okay, ready? These are really important. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> so was Jar Jar Binks really as bad as they said he was? Yes. <laughs> what would you rather own, the USS Enterprise or the Millennium Falcon? Millennium Falcon. Ooh. So when the first book is written on the moon, what's the title? Oh, Artemis Dreams. <laughs> I'm going to read that one. <laughs> when the first art piece is being painted on the surface of the moon, what's it of? Earth. Cheeseburgers or pizza? Pizza. What if there's no cheese? pizza. <laughs> when do you know the moon is a uh, finished dinner? Wait, what? Sorry, what was that? <laughs> when do you know, when do you know that the moon has finished dinner? When? <laughs> when it's full. <laughs> the student actually told me that last week on a call. <laughs> no, thank you so much for joining me today, Sarah. It's been so much fun to be part of Hack the Classroom, and it's always so great to get to know my coworkers better. So, of course, thanks to the Hack the Classroom team for having us today. This has been so much fun. So, stay curious, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Hello, everyone. Adam Parker Goldberg here, uh, coming from you from my from my office, my kitchen, my living room kind of my everything space. 
Uh, and if you're like me, you're probably thinking, Adam, wow, this Hack the Classroom has been incredible. I've heard of so many just renowned stories, amazing tools, and I'm ready to take these next steps in pursuing Hour of Code activities with my scholars. And where do I begin, Adam? Surely you can help us, right? Well, and you might also be thinking, Adam, stop referring to yourself in the third person. Let me do them all. Hello, I'm here. I'm here to help, and I have some amazing resources for you. So join me, will you? Uh, let's jump right in. Have you ever participated in a Microsoft Education Live event? We've had so many amazing adventures this year, and they're all available on demand. Think of this as like a virtual field trip on Teams where you get to bring your scholars on an adventure to meet engineers, programmers, and even NASA astronauts. There's lots more fun to look forward to, so mark your calendars for our next live event. Um, speaking of NASA, I've got some exciting news out of this world, astronomical news to share with you. Microsoft and Flipgrid have partnered with NASA to bring you Day of Data, an initiative to help your students understand and appreciate the data around us. What's so cool about these lessons in particular and these activities and the whole initiative is that everything is standard aligned experiences featuring real data from NASA that allowed rockets to say lift off uh, and explore outer space. So definitely check that out. In addition to that, we also have science, science curriculum, STEAM, coding, and so let's talk science with Let's Talk Science. Um, this amazing partner in the Flipgrid Discovery Library has put together some awesome discussion prompts, totally free and ready for you to use. Um, so head over to the Flipgrid Discovery Library, check out the Just Talk Science discussion prompt tile, uh, and uh, explore the amazing lessons available in English, Spanish, and French. Plus, all of the amazing stories you heard today will be available on the Microsoft Education YouTube channel. And you can even start by playing this very video with your scholars to show them the breadth of fantastic careers all rooted in computer science. Moreover, check out the Microsoft Education Center for a plethora of programs and resources to help you as you're starting your journey or helping colleagues along their way. Uh, and for those of you new to the Mac, signing up could not be easier. And I just, no way. Okay, so signing up could not be easier. I, I feel so powerful, I can't believe that worked. I feel like I could earn all of the badges. Well, well okay, let's go. Well, let's, let me sign off first. Thank you all so much once again for all you're doing to inspire your students as they explore their passion and learn about computer science. Stay tuned for a final word from our host, Diego. Back to you. Hello everyone, it's Diego again. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope you really had a great time learning from all our different guests, learn from these different stories that probably changed their lives for the better and actually have a better insight about how STEAM can change your life. Because we all learned that it's not something that works for the first time. It's more how we can learn from more mistakes and use the technologies and different uh, values that we're learning along the way to make better things together. And that's how, something that the STEAM gives to you. And that way of thinking is super, super valuable. So on behalf of everyone at Microsoft, thank you for coming up today, for hearing us, for spending our time. Thank you for our hosts, our guests, speakers, and everyone else involved to make this a uh, super incredible event possible. Have a great time. Have you ever come up to Seattle? Come by and see me. Say hi. I'm probably going to take a good picture at the offices. <laughs> Have a good day. Adios.